looks like Christmas has come and gone and we are here to enjoy some songs and stories on Christmas morning. I'm going to be reading from Christmas Comes Alive by Geneva Butts. Geneva was a pastor for many years at Old First Reformed Church in the heart of Philadelphia, one of the oldest of the evangelical reformed churches in the country. And uh, she, after that, was one of our conference ministers in Pennsylvania Southeast Conference. But before we get to that, uh, let's hear again the story that we are basing our, all our other stories on. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on peace earth among those whom God favors. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Know that it is true and can be trusted.
The basis of this book, Christmas Comes to Live, are stories that happened when this church in the heart of Philadelphia, and it really is in the most crowded part of Philadelphia, would have a live nativity each year, complete with animals. The first story that we're going to read out of the book is The Empty Stable. The stable is the centerpiece of our live animal Christmas crush. Usually, the Saturday after Thanksgiving is when Earl, the two Johns, Barry, Buzzy, Julio, and others gather to construct it. We use the same sides and fence and roof each year, so the men carry the big pieces outside, reassemble them, and patch or rebuild the pieces that have deteriorated over the past year. The major work can be completed in a day, at least with a full team of eight to 10 workers. Barry, Buzzy, and Julio are expert carpenters. They know exactly what to do. My job, coaching from the sidelines, is to encourage the men to slap it together, not caring whether the corners are exactly even or whether everything is perfectly matched. This is a crude stable a shack, a lean-to, and shouldn't look too secure, I argue. It's a challenge to the worker's professionalism to build a structure that appears obviously shoddy. At the end of the big work day, the major pieces have been put in place. John, Earl, and Bill add the finishing touches during the following weeks. There are spotlights to be set on an electric timer, plaques with biblical readings from the Christmas story to be nailed to the fence, tar paper to be tacked to the roof, straw to be spread on the floor. To avoid the possibility of having to work in uncooperative weather, all is readied days in advance. Then the stable sits there, empty, waiting for the animals to arrive. When will the animals get here? Six-year-old Kevin anxiously asks his grandmother as they round the corner into the church courtyard. It's the second Sunday of Advent and the stable is still empty. For two Sundays in a row, Kevin has come to church expecting to see the crush with the animals inside and still there is no sign of life. For a little boy, the wait seems endless. For us adults, the emptiness questions are fully scheduled and immediately satisfied lives. How long will it take? How stripped must we become? How do we prepare to receive the Messiah in a world that sees Christmas as a commercial holiday, a time for parties and shopping and gift giving? Can Christ be born into our logical and overly structured world? The crash sits there empty, challenging our agendas and our priorities, our goodwill, and even our somewhat stilted faith. Will God touch us once again with a gift so full of wonder and awe? Can we discover the child within us? with its tender trust and ever joyful hope? Are we open to be delighted by the surprising ways in which God chooses to visit us? Israel's longing for Messiah was kept alive over centuries. Will our Advent wait enable God's holiness to enliven us?
don't all stay. It is 8.45 a.m. when the driver pulls up to the corner of 4th and Ray Streets with a trailer filled with animals for our Christmas crash. The trailer has arrived right in the middle of rush hour traffic. Our corner is one of the busiest intersections in Philadelphia. Cars and trucks converge on 4th Street just two blocks from the only center city off-ramp for Interstate 95, a major artery that carries hundreds of commuters to work in downtown Philadelphia each morning. The trailer stops on 4th Street, blocking one lane of traffic. Cars have to merge to the right-hand lane. Philadelphia streets are narrow, especially in Old City and nearby Independence Mall. Usually drivers shake their fists, blow their horns, or get out of their cars and start yelling impatiently at any obstruction that blocks their way, particularly at this hour of the morning. But today, most drivers seem to slow down in order to get a better look. What's this? Animals in the city? On the way to work, no one expects to see sheep and donkeys and a cow. Earl has come to help place the mannequins and wait with me for the animals to arrive. We also have to put out feed and fill the water troughs. Then our job is to open and close the gate as one by one the animals are led into the fenced in area around the crash. We are to make sure that once inside the fence, none of the animals can escape. First, the sheep go in. They are quite cooperative. After all, they can be picked up and carried into the crush in the farmer's arms if they don't walk in on their own four legs. The donkeys wear halters. They come out next and are easy to manage. Last comes the cow. One person leads the cow by a rope tied to her neck. A second person holds her from the rear by her tail. Now what's wrong with the cow? She doesn't seem to want to come out of the trailer. This cow is very stubborn. The farm hands give her a shove and she steps out onto the pavement. So they just need to lead her through the fence. Earl and I have the gate open, but the cow decides to go in another direction. She rears up on her hind legs and runs off into the churchyard. The farmhands are still holding onto the rope and her tail. Now they both grab the rope, trying to pin her down, but she drags them, and finally, not to get hurt, they let go. Off she goes into the street. Cars screech to a halt. The farmhands are in pursuit. Earl and I can hardly bear to watch. It has been raining. When her hoofs hit the wet asphalt, the cow skids and falls right in the middle of the intersection. She gets up and runs into the Pincus Brothers parking lot across the street. The area has a big brick wall around it, so we breathe a sigh of relief. The farmhands have made it into the parking lot. Meanwhile, all traffic is at a standstill and the occupants of the cars are laughing at the comic scene that is unfolding before their eyes. Wait until they get to the office and tell their coworkers what happened on the way downtown. No one will believe this. A telephone repair worker appears out of nowhere with good strong rope and the cow is securely fastened to a post in the clothing factory parking lot. Pincus employees have left their machines and everywhere people are peering out of doors and windows. Live animals make our crush very unpredictable. 
The cow has made her debut in the city, but unfortunately she cannot stay. She is too unruly. This year our crash will be minus a cow. It is better to have one less animal than risk turmoil in the manger. Mary falls apart. Yes, Mary falls apart. It happens frequently. When a group of us return to the church after Christmas caroling in the old city neighborhood, Mary had fallen apart again. Even though John ropes off the part of the crash where the mannequins are, the sheep get in there. They like to snuggle close to Mary and nestle in the folds of her robe. When they stand up and turn around, oops, they push Mary off her seat. She tumbles into the hay. At other times, the wind whips through the crush and catches Mary's hair and she falls again. It looks so funny to see Mary, usually the model of serenity and composure, lying on the ground, sometimes in awkward, even comical positions. When I see Mary lying on the ground like that, I find her so very human. It seems fitting that she should be dismayed, overwhelmed, shattered, even broken by the events that have just happened to her. What one of us would not be devastated by the happenings surrounding the birth of Jesus? The angel comes to her and tells her that she is to bear a child whose name will be called Jesus, who will be a child of the Most High God. Mary must have worried about this news. How will she face Joseph, to whom she's engaged? How will her parents react? What will the neighbors say? When a child is born to an unwed mother, it is a devastating experience, even in our day. Mary's words, how can this be, since I have no husband, have been soul-searchingly repeated by many women around the world who find themselves in a similarly awkward position. If Mary is human, then Mary most certainly does what all the rest of us do when faced with such alarming news. Mary falls apart. The amazing part of the story is that eventually Mary chooses to believe what the angel told her. I am sure it didn't happen all at once. It took time for Mary to get it all together. She must have questioned and struggled with the news, but finally Mary chooses to believe all that the angel had proclaimed with, to her. With God, nothing is impossible. Then Mary can affirm, let it be done to me according to your word. 
Mary makes a journey of trust from disbelief and dismay to acceptance and even affirmation of all the angel has said. Mary believes that God's hand is upon her in a special way and that the child to be born to her will be holy. Ultimately, Mary is able to trust God. She is able to face the way things are in her life rather than the way she would like them to be. She is able to acknowledge that life is not turning out the way she wants it to be. Mary is able to accept the unacceptable, the unresolved nature of things, and so must we. To really trust is to refrain from having to know all the answers ahead of time or having to control all that will happen to us. To trust means to be able to leave some empty spaces when we fall apart. To trust is to let go and leave room so that God can indeed work a new thing in and through us. When I used this story as an illustration in a sermon the Sunday before Christmas, the church secretary inadvertently typed, many fall apart, as a sermon title in the Sunday Bulletin. Her title fits too, for many of us do fall apart. I was amazed at the number of parishioners who identified with Mary and could tell me so at the door that Sunday morning. Suddenly, they had words to describe, and it felt all right to admit that, like Mary, they too sometimes fall apart.
Lost Sheep. I returned from a trip to Princeton, less than a two hour drive north of Philadelphia. The animals had arrived that morning, but I had thought it safe to make a trip out of town for a few hours. It was almost dusk when I pulled into the church driveway and headed for my office. Ed met me at the crush and excitedly reported the news. The sheep are missing. They've been gone about an hour. We've looked everywhere for them. See, there's a hole at the back of the stable. He rushed me to the rear of the crash, and sure enough, there was a hole just wide enough for a sheep to squeeze through. Lois has been out looking in all the back alleys of Old City, Ed continues. Just then Lois arrived. No sheep anywhere, she sighed. Together, we searched behind the church building one more time, thinking they just had to be hiding there. What to do now? I'm sure the sheep aren't covered by our insurance policy, I thought. How could this have happened? Did someone steal the sheep, or did they run away of their own accord? How will I face the farmer? What kind of pastor am I anyway to let my sheep get loose? How will I ever find them? I recalled my first Christmas Eve at Old First. As the shepherds entered the tableau, I no announced their arrival with the familiar words from Luke's gospel. Suddenly, a sheep appeared at the front of the stable. One at a time, the other two sheep came out to the people. All three had heard my voice and responded right on time. But now three sheep were missing. They had wandered off while I was out of town. Well, what does an urban pastor do when she loses her sheep? Yes, I did. I phoned the police. Sure, lady, the voice on the other end of the telephone replied. You lost your sheep, and I guess your name is Bo Peep too, right? No, I pleaded. I really did lose three sheep. I'm the pastor of the church at 4th and Race Streets, which has the live animal Christmas crush. The animals arrived this morning, and now three sheep are missing. There's a big hole in the back of the stable, too. Okay, we'll send a car right away, the officer said as he hung up. A police car appears in a few minutes. The officer was courteous and listened patiently to our story. We showed him the hole in the rear of the stable, and then he asked me to sit in the police car so that I could help him write a report. He wanted a description of the animals. Funny, he muttered that no one called in. You'd think anyone seeing sheep wandering freely through the city would call the cops. I'll check again to see if anyone's made a report. No one had reported seeing or missing sheep. Okay, he said, I'll put it on the radio and we'll get an all points bulletin out right away. Meanwhile, I'll drive through the back streets of Old City to see if I can find them. I'll be in touch. I went back to the crush again. Where are my sheep? I cried. There was nothing to do but go inside the church office and wait. I thought I should telephone the church trustees to let them know what had happened. Also, I'd better get our carpenters back to repair the hole. Before I realize it, the donkeys, maybe even the cow will break out. I was sitting at my desk talking to one of the trustees when all of a sudden the lights went on in the crush. Night had fallen and the automatic time had, timer had triggered the lights. Out frolicked the three sheep quite innocently. I could barely believe my eyes. They were back, the sheep had returned. 
I ran out to the crush crying, the sheep are found, the lost sheep have come home. There was no one there to hear me, but I just had to shout it. Well, guess what? The sheep had never wandered away. They had been in the back of the stable all along, lying down among the folds of Mary's robe. They must have battered the hole in the stable wall, but they had never run away. It had been dusk, and no one had seen them hiding there in the straw. Could this be the case with church members who think, who we think have left the institutional church, I wondered? The back door may be open, but many of our lost members haven't gone out. Can we see them? Are we looking in the right places? They're still hiding in the membership roles, and especially at Christmas, they nestle very close to Mary. The fence around the creche includes plaques with readings from the prophet Isaiah announcing the promised Messiah and from the Christmas narrative in Luke's gospel announcing Jesus's birth. But the words of the noted African-American preacher Howard Thurman are also printed on one of the plaques and they bring the Christmas message to our contemporary world with startling clarity. Thurman writes about Christmas in his poem, The Work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart.
yes, Christmas is over, but the work of Christmas has only just begun. Go with God's grace and God's peace. Merry Christmas. Thank you.